All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Renee Davies. I'm a trip specialist at Nomad Adventures. Um, welcome to our presentation, Exploring Ecuador, Galapagos Islands Cruises and Mainland Travel. Um, so a little bit before we dive in just about Nomad Adventures and what we do, um, we are a travel company that we specialize in custom and private trips to South America. So what that means is instead of kind of group trips where you sign up to go on a set fixed itinerary with a group of people, you come to us with your own group. So we work with a lot of just couples, with groups of friends, with families, and we work with you to develop an itinerary that's tailored to your own travel style and interests. So I work with you to learn kind of how active you wanna be, the types of activities you enjoy, where you want to travel, how long you have to travel, what your budget is, the types of hotels you like, really everything under the sun to then develop your own itinerary tailored to you. And then when you arrive, you have local guides, um, you know, everything's taken care of for you, transportation, all of that, so you can just sit back and enjoy the trip. Um, a little bit just about our process and how we do that. Um, the first step in our planning process is a discovery phone call. So generally that's 20 minutes to an hour long phone call um, for me to learn those things about you and what you're looking for in the trip, do a lot of kind of education on the destination, answer questions, make suggestions for the trip. Um, and the goal of that call is coming off of it that I can send over a trip skeleton, which is just a high level overview of the trip I'd be recommending for you. Um, and then that, oh, that allows us to easily work through changes until we nail down the perfect trip for you before develop, developing a proposal, which is a full detailed custom itinerary, your exact trip costs, detailed descriptions of each day um, before you then book the trip or send in any form of payment. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. Um, like I said, we focus on South America. Within that, we mostly do Peru, Ecuador, Ecuador, the Galapagos as well, Chile and Argentina, a huge part of that being Patagonia, we do a little bit of Antarctica, Brazil, and we've expanded to Colombia now as well. All right, but that's enough about us. So I'm gonna dive into Ecuador. Um, so as you can see, Ecuador is pretty a pretty small country. Um, I really like the way it just says it here is big things come in small packages is an adage that holds true in Ecuador and the Galapagos. Mainland Ecuador is about the same size as the US state of Colorado yet it contains nearly every ecosystem imaginable without having imaginable without having to travel great time or distances. Visits to Ecuador can include cloud forest, Andean highlands, historic haciendas, remote indigenous communities, volcanoes, Amazon jungle, and colonial cities. Of course, no visit to Ecuador is complete without a visit to the famed Galapagos Islands. Um, someone in Ecuador once told me that when God was making the earth, he did Ecuador last and just kind of threw little pieces of everything that was left into Ecuador. And it really does feel that way when you're there. Um, as you can see from this map, yep, you have Quito, which is where you'll likely fly into. Um, and then within just two hours of Quito, you go this direction, you go northwest and you're in the cloud forest. You go north and you, well, this whole area is the Andes Mountains, but you go north and you have Otavalo, which is, um, and we'll go into each of these regions more, but um, you have one of the largest uh, artisan markets up there, beautiful Andes Mountain scenery. You go south and you have Avenue of the Volcanoes. You take a short 30 minute flight over the mountains. You're in the Amazon jungle. Um, you have coast and beaches along here. And of course the Galapagos, um, it really has, it's a great place to see so much in one trip without needing to devote a lot of time to travel. All right. Um, so I'm not going to speak too much about the history, but one thing that's interesting to know is that at, oh, my dog just ran in. Um, is it you don't have the same Incan history in Ecuador that you do in Peru. Um, so you're not going to see as many Incan ruins as you will in Peru. There's more Spanish colonial history there. Um, oh. The biodiversity is really incredible in Ecuador. It's actually the most biodiverse country in the world per unit area. Um, the Galapagos Islands especially are known for their large number of
fly into. You can fly into Guayaquil as well, um, which is a city on the coast, depending on where you're kind of flying from. For most Minnesota travelers and most travelers in general, you are gonna fly into Quito. Quito is a more um, interesting city to see than Guayaquil. You have this beautiful colonial architecture here, uh, cobblestone streets. It's one of the first UNESCO World Heritage Sites actually in the world. Um, so minimum, you're gonna need one night in Quito before you would then, if you're just doing a Galapagos Islands trip, you'd need minimum one night before flying to the Galapagos. However, I highly, highly recommend staying two nights. Um, one reason for that is if you have any, you know, if you're flying Minneapolis to Atlanta, then Atlanta to Quito, if your flight's delayed, canceled from Minneapolis to Atlanta, there's just that one Atlanta to Quito flight a day. So if you miss that, you're not arriving until the next day. And then you miss your flight out to the Galapagos. And if you're taking a cruise, then you miss the cruise. It's just a whole domino effect. So I highly recommend that buffer of two nights in Quito. So you have a full day the next day in case you have any flight issues, but also so you can see the city. Cause like I said, it is really cool. Um, I suggest staying in Old Town, which is the area that you see here. Newtown is where you'll have more modern architecture and the larger kind of US chains, but there's a lot of really cool hotels um, in this beautiful Old Town area. All right. So, so like I said, also just about two hours north of Quito, you have Otavalo. Otavalo is a great region to go to if you have an interest in culture. Like I said, the one of the largest indigenous markets in Latin America is in Otavalo here. Um, especially if you go on a Saturday, that's when you have locals from all over the region coming to, like you can see this woman here, trade their livestock. So maybe it's, I don't know the going rate, but maybe it's five chickens for a pig and you can see that happening, which is really cool. Um, so if you're into culture, definitely recommend thinking of visiting Otavalo. If, you, if it works with your itinerary, going on a Saturday is great. Um, but it's also a great area for, for hiking. You can see the mountain scenery here for biking, for horseback riding, um, all sorts of different activities. And you're at a lower altitude here than some of the other regions you can travel to. Um, so it works well for acclimatizing as well. Um, and then you also have a lot of beautiful haciendas. So I suggest actually staying in an hacienda outside of Otavalo. My favorite one is Hacienda Zuleta. Um, it is on the pricier side, but the Hacienda has a whole system of self-guided hiking trails. And you can really just, I could spend a whole week there without leaving the Hacienda and be entertained. So um, it's really not necessary to add that much additional guiding or transportation once you're there. So sometimes it, it kind of balances out the cost that way. So Hacienda Zuleta is one great recommendation for this region. Um, as far as time, you certainly can do day trips here. Like I said, it's only two hours from Quito, um, but that's two hours depending on traffic. So if you hit bad traffic, it could end up being five hours total in the car at least. Um, so I suggest spending time there. One night stays can be exhausting. So two nights I'd say is the ideal minimum amount for this um, region. Three nights is great as well. And then I've had people stay five, six nights here. Um, and certainly for the right traveler, that it, that's a great fit too. All right. So now again, just depending on the area of the cloud forest you're going to, I'd say two to three plus hours um, northwest of Quito, then you're in the cloud forest. This is a great region to visit if you are at all a birder. Um, in Ecuador, you have over a hundred different species of hummingbirds more than 500 species of birds. Um, and it's just, it's a beautiful area and great for birding. Um, again, you can do day trips to the cloud forest. So if you're short on time, um, but you really wanna see the cloud forest, um, you can do just a day trip from Quito. But again, it makes for a long day. So if you have the time for it, I suggest two nights minimum, three nights or more, if it's really your kind of main interest. Uh, Moshby Lodge is one fantastic lodge there. It is a luxury product, so it can be quite expensive. Um, if you're looking for more kind of three-star, clean and comfortable with iron cost, I really like Bella Vista as well, which especially is fantastic for birding. All right. 
So continuing kind of these regions around Quito, Avenue of the Volcanoes, or specifically just about two hours south of Quito, you have Cotopaxi National Park. This volcano here, you can see that is Cotopaxi. It's just this really perfect cone volcano and around it you have mostly flat Paramo, but you can see there's a few kind of other mountains as well, um, but just really gorgeous. Here you are at high altitude, um, depending kind of where exactly you're generally at 12,000 feet or above and then doing hiking, you're gonna get up even higher than that. So this is a region you do, don't fly into Quito and come here the next day and do a full day hike. Um, you really do want to acclimatize for this region. So you could do kind of two nights in Quito and then visit this area, take the first few days kind of easy, easing into your more difficult hikes. Or if you're spending quite a bit of time in mainland Ecuador and you're interested in several of these regions, doing Quito and then, for example, that Otavalo region I mentioned, and then coming here is a great way to acclimatize for it as well. Um, but you do have beautiful high altitude hikes. Um, you can even hike up to kind of the first refugio on this mountain. There's a nice hike around a lagoon with views of it as well. Also great horseback riding, mountain biking here. Um, so it's a great destination for more active travelers as well. Again, like the rest of these, you can do a day trip. It makes for a long day. So if you have the time for it, and especially if you're gonna to wanna to be doing hiking, I suggest staying two nights minimum. Um, and if you like a slower pace, you really wanna work up to some higher altitude hikes, then three nights or more can be nice as well. All right, so moving onward. So now we have Cuenca. Cuenca is a short flight from Quito. It is another colonial city. So if you're really interested in culture, colonial architecture, it's smaller than Quito, so that's nice. It's a little easier to navigate. Um, also for people who are looking at doing a longer trip and maybe want one spot to settle down and stay there for a week, Cuenca is a great fit for that. It's one of the most popular places where American expats settle down actually. Um, it's a beautiful city. Again, it is a flight from Quito, so I would suggest more Two minimum, three nights here is great. Um, and then it does, if you are interested in Cuenca, be, where Cuenca's at, you're actually then all your flights out to the Galapagos. If you're coming from Quito, it's gonna stop over in Guayaquil to, for passengers to get on and off the plane before continuing on. Cuenca is not that far from Guayaquil. It's just, it's actually beautiful drive where you go from high altitude down to then banana plantations, tropical climate down to Guayaquil. So I would suggest that's a nice way to kind of end the trip and set up for them the Galapagos doing that drive um, with the driver, I suggest from Cuenca to Guayaquil and then taking that flight out to the Galapagos the next day. All right, another region. So Amazon jungle, like I said, it's just a short 30 minute flight from Quito and you are in the Amazon. If you've never been to the Amazon and it is on your list of you really wanna go, Ecuador is a great spot to add that on. Um, there's a lot of great lodges. My favorite one is Napa Wildlife Center. The lodge, that lodge is still owned and operated by the local community. Profits go back into that local community. So I really love that aspect of it. But the accommodations are also very nice, but very, they're kind of these, I have a photo later on, but these private kind of casitas on this back lake um, and they're very nice, but very fitting of their surroundings. You fall asleep to the sounds of the jungle. Um, so they do a fantastic job, great guiding there as well. One important thing to know is this is the Amazon jungle. It's not the Amazon river. So if you're looking to go to the Amazon river, I suggest looking more towards Peru for that trip. And so since you do have the flight and then addition to the flight, you have quite a bit of travel on the river here to get to the lodge. I suggest a minimum of three nights. If the Amazon is part of the focus of your trip or you like a slower pace when you travel, then four nights can be great as well. All right, and then of course, the Galapagos Islands. Um, we'll talk a lot about kind of the Galapagos Islands later as well, cruise versus land-based and, and kind of those details. But one important thing to note here is sometimes people, I get inquiries and people want to do a day trip to the Galapagos or a trip of two days. 
It, you spend a good portion of your first day flying out to the Galapagos, getting out of the airport, then getting to the boat. If you're not doing a boat still, then getting from the tiny airport up here, which is on Valtra Island, pretty much the only thing there is the airport, getting from there to then your hotel in Puerto Ayora on this island. Um, so you lose most your first day in travel. And then same thing with the day you leave. Most flights are in the morning. So that day as well is lost to travel. And then this there, depending on the definition you go off of, there's somewhere around 20 different islands in the Galapagos. Um, so it's not like one island going to visit and then leaving. You would have to do a 16 day trip to cover all these islands and that's too much for most people. Um, but they cover an area about the size of the state of New York. So there's lots of kind of specifics with different itineraries, cruise versus land base, like I said, that we'll discuss, but that's kind of one important thing to clarify with some kind of misconceptions there. And kind of the incredible thing about the Galapagos Islands, one of the reasons to travel there is the wildlife really is amazing in that they have little to no fear of humans. Um, so really you, unlike some destinations, you don't have to go searching for them. They're right there in front of you at these different visitor sites and they're kind of unfazed by you. You have to work to go out of their way because um, they're not moving for you. And you have large colonies of iguanas unaffected by you, tortoises with snorkeling, sometimes snorkeling with sea turtles where again, they're just unfazed by you that you're like any other animal in the water with them. Um, so that's pretty incredible. All right, so I'm going to kind of scroll through some different photos of these regions we've discussed so far. So here again is Quito. Um, this is a photo taken of Casa Gangotena. If you prefer luxury level accommodations, that's a great hotel. Um, but again, you can see how pretty Quito is and it, it really is worth spending some time there. More photos of Quito. Um, you also just outside of Quito and I like combining it a lot of times with making part of a full day um, guided tour of Quito, seeing Old Town and then going up to the equator. Um, my favorite museum up there is Intignan and that museum is right on the equator. So you can see all the side effects of standing right on the equator. They'll do the thing with the sink where they move it a foot off and the water flows a different direction. Um, it's also really interesting. You have different amounts of strength when you're standing on the equator versus right off it. So that's a really fun visit to do while you're in Quito too. All right, so now Otavalo again. So that's the market that I talked about. That's when um, on the Saturdays when there's the livestock market. Some of the other stuff you'll see there and some of the scenery up there. Again, I like the haciendas. Hacienda Zuleta is great. Um, Hacienda Cuisine's another option that's a little bit more affordable, closer to Otavalo as well. And local kids, you can see the kind of beautiful clothing. That's Jordan and Tara Harvey, Nomad's co-founders. Um, and this is Cuicocha Lagoon, Lagoon, which is near Otavalo. It pairs really well with the day to visit the market. And you can actually, if you have time for it, hike around the rim, which is beautiful. Just some more kind of photos. This is at Hacienda Zuleta. That again is Taryn Jordan with their kids on a trip to Zuleta. Um, if you're traveling with kids, Zuleta is a great option with kids because it's so with the self guided hiking trails and everything they have on site, it's really flexible, which works nice. That's Tara and I for us in there. You can see llamas, alpacas. Um, if you like horseback riding, it's a great place to go. This is Tara bringing in the horses in the morning. This is Zuleta is the name of the hacienda, but it's also the community there. Um, and this is just out in the local Zuleta community. All right, so Avenue of the Volcanoes, specifically kind of going towards Cotopaxi National Park, um, which is close to Quito. Um, you can, if you, you know, really like road trips, you can, and again, I, I do suggest doing this with a driver and transportation. Um, you can do a road trip from Quito, going to Quito, then Cotopaxi National Park, and kind of a whole beautiful route 
south from there to Cuenca or then to Guayaquil. And it's a lot of driving, but if you don't kind of mind sitting back and watching the scenery, that's a nice trip too. This is one of the stops. Um, it's not far from Cotopaxi, but it is still a kind of a lot of driving from there. It works well on if you're doing that full trip south. More of the kind of bottom of scenery, scenery there, mountain biking. This is in the cloud forest, the coffee beans. Hiking to waterfalls in the cloud forest. Um, lots of beautiful flowers. This is, at, I believe it's El Monte where they have this tram that takes you across El Monte is another lodge there. Takes you across to the lodge. Lots of great butterfly gardens as well. This is an observatory at Mashpi. Beautiful orchids. So this is Mashpi, that more luxury lodge. Um, they call it a cocoon in the clouds and I really love that description because not glass windows. So you're seeing the cloud forest at all times and it's, it's really beautiful. The hummingbirds, like I said, there's more than a hundred different species of hummingbirds in Ecuador. So if you're a birder, I really think the cloud forest is a must on your trip. Um, I've had birders before go to Ecuador and go to the cloud forest and go to the Galapagos and they came back raving more about the cloud forest. So um, just says a lot. So this is the Amazon. One of the things you can see in the Amazon there are these macaque lalix, which is really cool. You see a lot of them, a lot of the macaques. Different monkeys in the Amazon. And that is that Napa Wildlife Center Lodge that I um, said I recommended. You can see they're these very kind of fitting of their surroundings, but very nice as well along this lagoon here. Um, kind of casitas. And the Caymans, you can go out on kind of nighttime um, searches for the Caymans. The Amazon is very different than the Galapagos, than the wildlife experience in the Galapagos. Here it is wildlife that you really have to go searching for. Um, but that to me is the incredible part of that wildlife experience is you're out with the guide really looking for it. And it's just incredible what they're able to spot, whether it's this um, frog perfectly camouflaged on a leaf that you would never see if you were out on your own or monkeys kind of way off in the trees. Um, it's a cool part of that experience. Because of that, I do like if you have the ability to do the Amazon prior to the Galapagos, because when the Galapagos, the wildlife, you don't have to search for it, it's right there in front of you. Then doing the Amazon after that, um, I don't wanna say underwhelming, because like I said, it's a very cool wildlife experience on its own, but I do like it prior to that experience where the wildlife is just in front of you. Right, so, and on to the Galapagos. So, this is paddle boarding, which you can do on a land-based trip or some cruises have paddle boards as well. Um, so while you're on a cruise or a land-based trip too, doing day trips out to other islands, all the boats have these smaller Zodiac boats on the back and that's how you will then get into the different visitor sites. Um, so this is a dry landing where you will step from the boat either on to generally the rocky shore like this or some sort of dock. Um, and then there's also wet landings where you are just stepping off of the boat straight into the water and then walking on shore. For those wet landings, that's why it's good to have um, kind of shoes like those, you know, whether they're Tevas or Keens, ones that you can wear to kind of um, step off into the water and get onto shore. And then if they're not good walking ones, you can just have your socks, a little towel and your tennis shoes in your backpack to switch into those and out of the other ones. Otherwise, um, if you have good keens that are also really good walking shoes, um, you can use those for the, the visit as well. Sea turtles. Um, the snorkeling. So snorkeling, depending on the site, it's sometimes you can snorkel with sea turtles, sometimes sea lions. If you're lucky, sometimes penguins. 
I've even had travelers snorkel together with iguanas. Um, so the wildlife experience while snorkeling really is very fun. <laughs> baby sea lions, um, which can be quite playful with snorkelers and kayakers. Um, being enriched, this is some kayaking on a land-based trip. Um, a lot of the cruises now do have kayaks as well, and they'll have one visitor, so depending on the length of the cruise where they have permits to kayak. Um, this is Claudio, who's our friend and owner of the Lava Lodge on Floriana, helping them get the kayak going. So again, you can see, you know, you really have to make sure to keep your distance from the animals because they, you know, if he moved closer, they, they wouldn't be phased by it. So you need to keep, do your part to keep your distance, but it's really incredible just how close the animals are. This Pinnacle Rock, a nice site on Bartholome Island. A uh, hotel, so this is, you know, one example of a hotel, this is, um, Habitat Galapagos that's on in Puerto Ayora on Santa Cruz Island. So some of the hiking, if you're doing, and again, I'll just kind of dive in more after these photos on cruise versus land-based, but if you're doing a cruise, you're not gonna be doing long kind of full day hikes. They do have to cater to a wide variety of activity levels. They're generally shorter hikes. Um, an hour or so and you know the purpose is seeing the wildlife so they're slower walk a little bit stop and see the wildlife some of the marine wildlife the land iguanas these birds i love the red frigate birds and they puff out their red chest to attract a mate pelicans we do have some beautiful white sand beaches there as well um, some of the cruises have private balconies. So if that's important to you, something to look for. Mostly just the luxury class cruises will have those. Lava cactus. Um, and it's, you know, wildlife is a lot of people what they're going to the Galapagos for, but you also just have really interesting geology with kind of the volcanic activity in the Galapagos. Beautiful sunset. So the tortoises um, really are huge. And again, you can get quite up close to them. The blue-footed boobies, more paddle boarding. Um, so this is what a lot of the snorkeling is like, where you're just kind of getting off the Zodiac boat into the water to, to snorkel. Um, sometimes you're snorkeling from a beach from the shore, but more often it's this. Dolphins sometimes. Example of some of the dining on the cruises. This is near Puerto Ayora and Santa Cruz. So you can see with the tortoises, you're quite close and they are quite huge. <laughs> Another hotel, this is Finch Bay, a very nice hotel in that town, Puerto Ayora. And um, Ocean Spray, another cruise. Okay, so picking between cruise versus land base. So you kind of heard a little bit of this, um, but so there's two different ways to see the Galapagos and you can combine the two as well. So one is cruise, one is doing a land-based trip where you are staying at a hotel and either doing day trips out to other islands or doing island hopping where you're hopping between the different islands that you're allowed to stay on. Um, so the advantages and disadvantages of each. So cruise, it is great if your main focus of the trip is wildlife, especially if you're shorter on time um, and you don't have any concerns with being on a boat, then cruise generally is the way to go. They are very time efficient. So as with a land-based trip, if you're doing a day trip out to some of these islands with incredible wildlife, you are naturally going to lose some time getting from your hotel to the pier, depending on which island you're going to. That could mean a transfer of five minutes. It could mean a transfer of an hour. Um, then getting on that boat and the boat to the other island could be one hour to two hours there and back. So they are very time efficient in the sense that on a cruise, the boat is moving when you're on board sleeping, when you're on board having lunch, during your kind of breaks. So every morning you're off the boat for an excursion, whether it be snorkeling, whether it be one of those walks, um, whether it be kayaking or one of those Zodiac boat rides where you're just seeing wildlife from the boat and then you're back on for lunch, the vessel usually moves to a different visitor site. They do have set itineraries already that are determined where they're gonna go and what activities you're permitted to do. 
then again off the boat in the afternoon for another excursion and then back on for dinner and to go to bed. Um, so they are moving and getting to different spots while you're on board doing those things. So you don't, they're very efficient in that regard, which allows you to see a lot of different island visits, visitor sites, um, and a lot of wildlife in a shorter or longer period of time. However, they are very structured. It's a very good thing that the national park and over 90% of the Galapagos Islands is a national park and it's very restricted. For these cruises to go there, they need a permit that they can go from this time to this time and these are the activities that they're allowed to do. Um, so if you're someone that likes more free time and flexibility each day, what you're doing, um, how long you spend at a certain site, then a land-based trip or combining land with cruise can be a good direction to go so you have more of that flexibility. We can also do it fully private and personalized. Unless you're a larger group and you're chartering a boat, which is possible in the Galapagos, the smallest ships are 16 passengers. So if you have a larger group of friends, a multi-generational family trip, chartering a boat can be fantastic. But for most people, if they want a private personalized experience, then we're looking towards land. And with that, we can also make it more active. If you want to see the wildlife, but you also really want to get out there and be doing full day hikes, you want to be biking, you want to do multiple kayaking trips, you want to stand up paddleboard, we can make a really active land-based trip where you have more of that potential. Again, with the cruises, well, there are a few kind of hikes within the Galapagos and you're doing lots of walking and staying active in that sense. They do have to cater to a variety of different activity levels on the board. So if you want to be doing full day hikes, then I would suggest a land-based trip or at least pairing land-based with the cruise. Um, and then culture as well. You know, culture is not generally the reason people are going to the Galapagos, but you do have a really interesting history and culture there. Um, meeting more of the people that are living in the Galapagos, hearing their stories is really fascinating. It's often one of my favorite parts. Um, so pairing even just with a few nights so you can see Puerto Ayora, which is one of the main towns, um, that can be a great reason for land base too. All right, so kind of some of these areas I've been talking about, there's two different airports in the Galapagos, main ones that connect to Ecuador. You have Baltra, which is just above this main island here, Santa Cruz, and then you have an airport on San Cristobal. There's four islands that are inhabited in the Galapagos and that have hotels where you can stay. One is Santa Cruz. The main town there is Puerto Ayora, where you can stay in town, or you can also stay in the highlands. If you like more being remote out in nature, there's some really good accommodations. Um, Magic Galapagos is a cool one that has tortoises often. It's their natural habitat there. So you'll have tortoises going by your like safari style tent. There's some cool accommodations there too. Um, San Cristobal, you can stay on. There's a large town there. Puerto Ayora is the largest town, but there's a, the capital of the Galapagos and a significant sized town on San Cristobal as well. You have Floriana, which if you really, that cultural aspect appeals to you, I suggest going to Floriana. Um, there's a town of just about 50 people and it has just this really fascinating, mysterious history to it um, of when it was first settled, all these mysterious disappearances and things. And Claudio, who I kind of mentioned in an earlier side, has the only hotel there and his family were some of the first people to settle on this island. So kind of arrived shortly after this mysterious history and hearing about it from him is, is really cool. And then you have Isabella, um, which is this large island here. And there's a small, um, very relaxed beach town vibe town there, a uh, beautiful white sand beaches. One important thing to know, I hear from a lot of people, well, I wanna do a land-based trip and I wanna visit this site, for example, up here on Isabella you can't access this area of Isabella on a land-based trip. It's too far away. So if you're doing a land-based trip, you're gonna be seeing this area around here mostly. Um, so those are the four different islands you can stay on on a land-based trip. So you can either base yourself from one of these doing day trips to nearby islands, or you can do an island hopping program where you stay on two up to four different islands. Um, and if you really don't want to kind of be doing these day trips out to other islands, that can be a nice way. And it's a great way to do a lot of different activities by doing an island hopping program like that as well. And then as far as cruises, 
I'll show you kind of a brief itinerary later on. Um, but like I said, to see all these islands, you would need a 16 day cruise. So usually a cruise itinerary is just going to focus on one section of the Galapagos. Common one common itinerary is a Western Islands itinerary that will go around the western side of Isabella, combining with some of these smaller islands as well. A northern itinerary, especially for shorter cruises, is common going up here to Genovesa, which you can only reach on a cruise. The western side here only reach on a cruise. Um, other common itineraries are the southern itinerary, sometimes flying into San Cristobal, doing the southern route, and then up to Santa Cruz. Um, I, with people, I work with a lot of people who have almost done too much research and gotten too sucked into, well, which itinerary I should I do? Um, I would suggest, you know, making sure you're partnering with a good, reputable boat and a lot of the main wildlife, unless you really have some very specific experience you want, you're going to see tortoises on any well-planned trip. You're going to see sea lions. You're going to see the blue-footed boobies. If it's important for you to see them up close, that's something I would um, ask the person that you're working with, um, let your trip specialist know, let your crews know, um, you know, if you're working with us, let us know that. And there are specific sites that are better for seeing them up close, but on any trip, you'll see them flying above, um, or kind of far off on the rocks. You'll see iguanas on any trip. So kind of the main wildlife people are looking forward to, you're going to see on any trip. Um, so don't get too sucked into it. I see it more often where people get too hung up on the itinerary where then they don't end up going at all. Um, and you're gonna have an amazing wildlife experience on, an, on any Galapagos cruise. Um, so how to pick the best cruise for you? I suggest focusing a lot more on the type of vessel that is the best fit for you. So with that, considering boat size and type, um, cruise duration, and then like I said, a little bit with the itineraries if you have specific things you really want. Um, so not too much on the boat type. You do have mono hulls, catamarans, and then very, very few sailboats, and they can't, you know, there's hmm. Renee, can you hear us? You just I see you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just find your presentation again. One moment here. Okay. Um, My video disappeared and I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah, it looks like the, the shared screen was lost. Oh, let me get that back. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. And I'm streaming over there? Yep, you're good. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you have seasickness concerns and you want to be on a smaller boat, I would suggest looking towards a catamaran or a luxury class monohull that has stabilizers. Some of these newer monohulls, they have the stabilizers and they're quite as, they're sta as stable as a catamaran. Um, but if you're looking at kind of more, the older, more kind of, you have a few different classes of vessels in the Galapagos. You have luxury, then right below that, and first class tour, then right below that tourist superior. Um, those are the classes we work with. If you're looking at more kind of budget friendly tourist superior option and you have seasickness concerns and want to be on a smaller boat, I would suggest mainly maybe looking towards those catamarans. Um, the biggest thing with seasickness, I would say, is some seasonality. You get rougher waters kind of from end of July through kind of beginning of October is when you can get choppier waters. Um, so if you want to be on a smaller boat, you have those seasickness concerns, look towards, like I said, a luxury class with stabilizers, a catamaran, and then staying outside of that window. Um, and then more with this, I talk about boat size. Um, so you have kind of three different sizes of vessels in the Galapagos. You have the small ones, which are generally 16 to 20 passenger ships. Um, you have the medium sized ones, kind of 30 to 50 passenger ships. And then the largest vessels in the Galapagos are kind of 90 to 100 passenger, which in the cruising world is still a relatively small cruise. They're not these giant cruises you get in the Caribbean. Um, so they're all pretty small experiences. And then one thing to keep in mind is the 16 passenger vessels, those are only going to have one guide. 
Um, whereas the larger ships, they have multiple guides. So sometimes with your traveling with kids, I can suggest looking towards those larger sizes. So you're more like, so they have that flexibility to pair you with other families. Um, or if you're less active, that can be a reason to look towards the larger ships as well. Um, because again, they're trying to work with all sorts of different activity levels with just one guide on a 16 passenger ship. Whereas on the larger ship, they can divide people up a little bit on how active people are. So that can be a nice reason to look towards the larger size as well if you fall into kind of either one of those categories. Otherwise, we do really love that small size because it is a very personalized experience. You get to know everyone, you get to know your guide really well. The guide's often sitting and having dinner with everyone in the evenings. Um, so you get kind of more access to them too. They're a nice experience. Um, duration, so like I kind of spoke about earlier, you really lose most of your first day and most of your last day on your flights to and from the Galapagos. So a three night, four day cruise on its own is really too short. That really only gives you two days to experience the Galapagos. And you're not gonna see, you're gonna see a lot in those two days, but it's just, it's a lot of travel and the flight to get there is generally about $500. You have $120 of park fees. So it's a lot of time and money invested for just two days. Um, however, I love the three night, four day cruises for doing that land and cruise combination. You can use the three night, four day cruises to really take advantage, advantage of all the, um, take advantage of all the pros of a cruise um, and then get off the boat and have some more active time, more flexible time, maybe just relax on a beach as well too. Um, so they work great for that. So do the four night, five day ones. Four night, five day is also, if you're just gonna do a cruise, I consider that kind of the minimum. And they are a great fit if you're on a shorter duration and you really like some of what you heard from mainland Ecuador and you wanna see some of that as well. That's a great duration for leaving time to see mainland Ecuador as well, leaving budget for that as well. And it's also a great duration if you're considering a Machu Picchu Galapagos trip. Um, and then five, after that five night, six day, kind of as you just add more, you're just gonna see a little bit more, um, get more snorkeling experiences, more walks in there. Six days is a fantastic duration. Unfortunately, not a lot of cruises offer it. So if you're set on six days, it's gonna limit your options. Um, and then seven night, eight days, kind of your classic full length cruise. Um, if the Galapagos is the focus of your trip, you've been wanting to go to the Galapagos for years and you do like, land visits as well as snorkeling, then seven night, eight days is a great fit. Um, my biggest recommendation with seven night, eight days is if you're someone that you don't like to snorkel, you're not gonna wanna do water excursions. That can then be too long for those travelers um, because you're gonna have quite a few visits where it's a snorkeling visit and you're not gonna wanna participate. Um, or if you do really wanna do a longer cruise and you don't want water visits, then I'd look towards a larger boat where they have the glass bottom boats. Um, and like I said, they have more of that ability to split travelers up based on some of that. Um, Renee, can you hear me? in front of you, I suggest an itinerary that includes North Seymour or an itinerary that includes Española. Um, those are great spots to see the blue-footed boobies. Um, if you really want to see penguins, that one is an important one for us or whoever's planning your trip to know because you're not going to see those on every trip. The penguins are great to see from Isabella Island and also from Bartolome. Those are the best spots to see the penguins. Um, and then if you're just really interested in birds in general, there's a few different, like I said, North Seymour is great for birds and so is Española. From the end of April through December, you have the entire world population of the waved albatross on Española, which can be really incredible. Um, and then Genovesa as well is a really great island for, um, for birding. Um, snorkeling, there's great snorkeling throughout the Galapagos. Um, if that's your main
Renee, can you hear me? Hey. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how long I was talking without anyone there. I kind of just noticed it. Um, probably maybe close to a minute or so. I tried calling you, but it went to voicemail. Um, oh, that was you. I yeah. I just assumed it was. I just kept speaking. <laughs> uh, no worries. Um, we can hear you. I can hear you. I can't see your presentation. Um. Okay, let me get it back open here. Okay, I think I can't. Um, you'll have to make me the host. Oh, to yes, yes, that's right. Uh, and more, make hosts. Okay. All right. And what was the last thing I was saying? Do you remember? Um, and I talked about weather. No, I didn't hear the weather. I remember the um, talking about the, um, I can't remember the, the word. I could see it on the slide. 
keep going up. Islands. Uh, Bar Bartolome and North Seymour. It was like after that that it kind of cut out. So at that islands with the with the, with the iguana there. Be, okay. Yeah. Um, but I talked about duration of cruises then. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but let me actually get my video back on too. Um, perfect. So I'll, I'll kind of. I'm not not sure how much of the island stuff you guys heard. So I'm just gonna kind of recap that a little bit just in case um so kind of the main things with the different islands if you if penguins are important to you i suggest going to isabella or going to bartolome if the blue-footed boobies having a close-up experience are important to you i suggest north seymour or espanola um if you're a really big birder and that's a for focus again north seymour or espanola espanola has from april to december the entire world population of the waved albatross which is really cool to see um genovesa as well is great for birding um and then snorkeling there's lots of great snorkeling in the galapagos but if that's your main driver of your trip what you're looking forward to the most i suggest the western side of isabella or specifically on Floriana, a cruise that goes to um, the Devil's Crown site on Floriana. So there's kind of a few tips. If you have you know, a specific experience you're really looking for, some islands you can um, look for in your itinerary. So weather, um, I was saying there's not a ton of seasonal variation. As you can see, when it comes to temperatures, lows are generally in the 30s. This is for Quito, highs in the 60s, um, but you do get a rainy and dry season, there is quite a bit of rain throughout the year. So you're going to want your rain jacket whenever you're going. But June, July and August is when you get the least rain in the driest amount of time. So if you're really doing a hiking intensive itinerary in mainland Ecuador um, and you really want to avoid the rain as much as you can, you could look more towards June, July, August. Um, and the Galapagos. So the biggest seasonal variation there is that time with the rockier waters that I was mentioning. So kind of end of July through October, beginning of October. If you have a concern about seasickness, I would suggest avoiding that time. Um, but on the flip side, it's also the coolest time of year, especially August, September, you can see lower temperatures then. Um, so if you have a really hard time dealing with hot, humid weather, that could be a reason to go during that season. Um, on the other side, kind of February, March, April, that's when you have the hottest temperatures. Um, it's also when the waters are, are the calmest. Um, you don't ever get really rocky seas in the Galapagos like you do in some destinations. Um, but if you are really concerned about seasickness, that could be a reason to look towards those months to travel. Um, wildlife, really the wildlife, unless you know you're saying, I have to see the waved albatross, which I've never had someone tell me that. Um, the wildlife is amazing year round. There's always something different going on, whether it be a breeding season, whether it be a hatching season and you're seeing lots of babies, there's always something different going on and it varies between the different species. Um, and a lot of them are opportunistic breeders as well. So it can even change from year to year. Um, so the wildlife is really fantastic year round. It, Galapagos definitely is a year round destination. All right. so. Passport, um, you just need a passport good for six months beyond your dates of travel. Um, this is when I'm kind of going to talk about COVID as well. Currently, right now, you do need a negative PCR COVID test from within 10 days of travel to arrive in Ecuador. Um, so that makes it very feasible for people who are itching to get on a trip next year. Um, Ecuador is a good place to think about going because the flight is pretty short from the US. Um, and then within Ecuador, like I said, it's short transfers, private transfers. Um, it, it's a pretty friendly destination to that. Um, the Galapagos, you do need a test from within 96 hours. Like I said, I suggest two nights minimum in Quito as a buffer between mainland, between the flight from the US and flying to the Galapagos. Um, so that makes it difficult to meet that 96 hour requirement. So what we suggest and are doing with people's trips is that test in the US within 10 days of your travel to Ecuador, arrive in Ecuador, do your time in Quito, any other time that you're planning to spend in Ecuador, we arrange for another test within Ecuador where you can get next day results. So you take that test results the next day and then you fly to the Galapagos. 
with those 96 hour requirement met. We don't really know when that will change. That's anyone's best guess. Um, but for trips, I'd say winter, early spring, probably kind of plan on those requirements likely being similar. Um, immunizations and shots, aside from that COVID requirement, um, right now, other than that, nothing required. Um, we do suggest a yellow vaccination if going to the Amazon. Um, and then typhoid and hep A can be a good idea as well, but no requirements. All right, they use the US dollar in Ecuador. So that makes it really easy to travel there. Um, going to an ATM, that's what is going, you're going to get out every pricing in dollars. That's what they've used since 2000. So it makes it really easy. Also making it easy, they use the same um, volt and prong type in Ecuador. So you don't need any of that. Water, don't drink the water. Cruises will let you know whether the water from their sinks is safe. Generally, they'll have a large kind of container with water that is safe for you to drink so you can fill your own water bottle. Um, a lot of cruises will give you your own, but I suggest bringing one as well for that time in Quito before you fly to the Galapagos. Um, and then hotels, they'll have a large kind of container of water you can use to fill your water bottle um, or at kind of breakfast they'll have where you can fill your water bottle. Um, packing, so I talked about shoes a little bit already. Um, you can find all of this on our website as well, which is www.nomadknowmadadventures.com. And if you're going on a trip, we'll send you a packing list. Um, biggest thing I'm gonna point out here is sunblock. Do not forget your sunblock. You're right on the equator. The sun is very strong and it's very expensive to buy if you forget it in Ecuador. So make sure you remember sun protection. So here's a sample seven night, eight day itinerary. So you can see even with seven night, eight days, you kind of see one portion of the Galapagos. I believe this cruises, usually they do one itinerary, seven night, eight days. The next eight days, they flip to a different itinerary. Their other one, for example, goes up to Genovesa and then over here. Um, so that's how you can kind of see what a sample itinerary looks like and the different island visits that they do. Um, this is a sample itinerary you can see on our website as well. Um, like I said, everything we do is custom. So if you are interested in planning a trip, the best first step is to just reach out to us so we can discuss with you and then send over what we would suggest for an itinerary. And a, if you're just looking at a land, mainland Ecuador trip, a really cool one is combining the Amazon jungle with Cotopaxi or Otavalo or both of those. It's a really cool combination that shows you how dramatically different landscapes you can see within one country. Um, and you can also see our land-based trip online, which is a sample island hopping trip where you stay on Santa Cruz, Floriana, Isabella. You do a cool day hiking up a volcano. You do kayaking, stand up paddle boarding, um, great snorkeling, like I said, hikes, some cultural visits as well. So if you're looking for a land-based trip, this is a, a great one. That's a sample trip on our website. Um, all right, so we um, generally, this presentation is for the expo. So we generally have coupons laid out for people to get afterwards. Um, if you are interested in a coupon, just send us an email. You can email me at um, Renee, R-E-N-E-E -E, at nomadadventures.com or you can just email travel at nomadadventures.com. Let us know you attended this presentation and we'll send you a $200 travel credit back. Um, I just ask that you email us before the end of November because I know this presentation's going on YouTube as well. So we don't wanna be <laughs> giving them out forever. So if you would like this coupon, just email us before the end of November and we'll send one back to you. Um, and with that, I'm gonna take a look at the questions and sorry with the kind of delay with the internet um, running a little bit out of time, but let me look through some of these. Best time of year to go to Ecuador and or the Galapagos. Um, so like I said, any time of year is good with the Galapagos. That really comes down to, do you have seasickness concerns? Are you gonna be doing a lot of hiking in mainland Ecuador? Um, but yeah, so if you have those seasickness concerns, I suggest avoiding that kind of July through October time. Um, I really like kind of those in between times when you're not in that time frame and you're not in the hottest time either. So I really like kind of that May, early June time frame. 
And then on the flip side, I really like November, early December, um, staying outside of that holiday window generally because there's just a lot more people there. Um, those are kind of two of my personal favorite times, but it really truly is just a great year round destination. Um, and then is there a way to combine some of the crews and some of the land based activities in one trip, get the best of both approaches. Yes, there is. It's one of my personal, again, favorite ways because I really love some of the cultural aspects of a land based trip, um, but I love the wildlife experiences that you get on some of these further out islands on a cruise. So I love a trip where you're combining three or four night cruise, or if you have a longer duration, even a longer cruise with then a few nights or more on land. Um, I have done some trips where people really are interested in the Galapagos. They have a longer period of time where we've done two weeks in the Galapagos pairing lots of different experiences. Um, but for most people, a land-based cruise trip, a good combination is three or four nights on a cruise plus two to four nights land-based what you want to do. All right. Um, those are all the questions I see on, but it also says it's loading. Are there any other questions there? Adon? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, hold on one second. Hi, Renee. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Sorry, I uh, was checking the chat window here and I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'm just going to take one more look. I can see it's chat. refreshing on mine too. Um, any other questions? Nope, I think that might be it. All right. Well, thank you guys. So sorry about the internet issues. I, I think it was on my end. Um, so sorry about that. But um, certainly, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is renee at nomadadventures.com. Again, that's R-E-N-E-E -E at nomadadventures.com. So feel free to reach out. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you think of afterwards. And yeah, thanks so much for attending.